then when it starts streaming, there's a 20 second lag. Then when it starts streaming, there's a 20 second lag. All right, I do believe we are live. Let me mute YouTube. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming out to this question and answer conversation on uh, cover design and to join our guests. Um, my name is Connor Coyne. I am the author of Urbantasm and I would also like to introduce our other guests for tonight. Uh, tonight we have with us Darcy Rowan, she was Urbantasm's publicist in 2018 and helped us make many of the critical decisions that kind of kind of got this project into the air. Um, for more than 22 years, Darcy Rowan has been helping business leaders, management consultants, entrepreneurs, authors, publishers, and nonprofit executives achieve their marketing goals. Darcy excels at seeing the big picture and developing marketing and promotional strategies that get the desired results. She works hand in hand with her clients to identify promotional opportunities, to create multi-dimensional media branding initiatives and to execute impactful public relations and publicity campaigns. Uh, Ms. Rowan is a graduate of New York University with a degree in journalism. Um, until recently, she resided in Brooklyn, New York and uh, her husband is Antal. So thank you, Darcy, for joining us. Thank you, great seeing you. And we also have with us tonight, Sam Perkins Harbin, uh, Urbantasm's book cover and web designer. Captain Sam Perkins Harbin is a lifelong adventurer, an artist and a maker. He has produced a wide body of visual work in a range of genres and styles, not wanting to limit himself. He enjoys working with writers and musicians to produce and collaborate on cover art and promotional materials. He currently lives in a van, most likely down by the river. This is actually not a joke, but it is an awesome van. Um, but just as equally upon a mountain or at the sea. But like on a boat at sea, not in the van in the water because that would be weird. So thank you for joining us, Sam. Hi everyone. <clears throat> All right. So I also just want to thank our partners in this project. Um, uh, the Flint Festival of Writers has graciously agreed to partner with us tonight to help get the word out. I really appreciate. And of course, I need to thank my lovely and talented wife, Jessica, who will be moderating the comments on YouTube. So if you get a friendly hello while we're here talking and you're wondering how can they type and talk at the same time, that's actually <laughs> Jessica's intelligent voice at the other end of the keyboard. So I am very grateful to the Flint Festival of Writers and to Jessica. Um, I'm gonna try uh, not to talk too much, um, but I just wanted to say a couple words about why have this event and why have it like this. Um, before COVID took over, there were so many times and ways that writers could get out and share their work. There were launch events and reading series and library events and panel discussions and art walks and dozens of opportunities. Um, I really wanted to hold and host an opportunity to reveal the cover of the third book of the Urbantasm series, um, but that really, really only take about five minutes. And it, it, it really just didn't seem that exciting. And at the same time, I've noticed that the question of cover designs, uh, what is a good cover? Um, what does a good cover look like? What does a good cover accomplish? What does a bad cover do? Um, it's a constant source of anxiety for writers. And especially if you're a small press or if you're a self-published writer, you have a great deal of creative control and you maybe want to know how to utilize that opportunity the best. So with Urbantasm, I was very lucky to be able to work with a professional designer and a professional publicist to create a wonderful, beautiful set of covers. And I just thought this was a conversation which we could have and which um, people might enjoy. So um, tonight I've prepared a few questions for Sam and Darcy just to get the ball rolling. 
I hope that in the meantime, you will comment on YouTube and add any questions that you have. And as soon as uh, you know, we've been talking for a few minutes, we'll shift over to your questions. And then later on, Sam has a slideshow for us. And at the end of the night, I have uh, the cover of the book. And last thing, I also have a salty dog. It is uh, appropriate to celebrate a momentous event. <laughs> And we've been working on this book as a team now for more than four years. So cheers to Sam and to Darcy and to all of you out there. Cheers. Cheers. All right. My first question is for Darcy. Darcy, what makes a good cover? Oh, my goodness. So <laughs> a, good, a good cover is anything that draws you into the book right because remember when we used to go into bookstores and it was a million covers on the walls and you're going through your bookshelf and certain colors and looks uh jump out at you but now for the most part we're not doing that anymore we're just online scrolling and looking at pictures and hoping that something will make us pay attention so it's it's a good cover is something that shows what the book is all about a little bit, like something that intrigue that pulls you in. And it also showcases the title um, in a readable way. And um, it also is something that, that gives you an idea that this might possibly be exciting for the genre that you're interested in. All right. And uh, my second question is for Sam. Um, Sam, where do you get your ideas? Um, I get my ideas, I think, from just browsing around um, books that, you know, books that I like to read, um, images that I find striking or bold or, um, you know, particularly jarring and indifferent so i'll kind of just go through with a you know perhaps like a a, a color in mind that i might be looking for or some type of composition and then i just kind of rapidly will <clears throat> look through images and I'll, I'll save those you know that i find intriguing and i'll just kind of build a personal catalog of images and then from that you know kind of uh overview of pictures i'll just kind of assemble something in my mind and then uh start making you know, start making from that. <clears throat> Just to kind of follow up with, with each of you respectively on your, your answers to those. Um, I, think, uh, I think one of the first big ironies once you get out of the, the just writing part of writing and into the publishing and promoting part is of course we've got this adage that everybody knows, which is don't judge a book by their cover. And one of the first hard <laughs> realities you realize is that Everyone judges book by their <laughs> colors. Some people are very apologetic about it. Some people not so, but it is literally the first thing you encounter of most books. And um, you, you usually like make a decision whether to pick up that book before you even read a, a single word of it. So um, with, with that in mind, Darcy, um, <laughs> I think, I think something that any writers here will be anxious to hear, um, what, are some, what are some design faux pas? Like what are some things where you see that on a cover and you're like, oh, they don't know what they're doing or that just got slapped together or they, they, the writer did this themselves. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the thing about um, book covers is um, most people, who read certain genres are really drawn to certain genres because of the look of the book. There's, there's like significant ways that are always that type of book. And there's certain characteristics. So if I'm looking for horror books, they're usually dark and they have, you know, black backgrounds and they have a lot of red and um, they have like a violent look to it. And that's something that the reader is looking for because it's something that they're used to. So that's really what happens is whenever a writer um, is doing design work with their cover person, um, 
normally the book publicist doesn't get involved in this aspect of it. But mm -hmm. every once in a while we do. We step into we're allowed to be part of the creative process. And my thing is, I always say to the writer, go to a bookstore, go to your genre, turn the covers to towards you and look at how they're so similar. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some areas, some genres is a picture of a girl, you know, sitting in a boat or walking with her friends. And you know that that's automatically chicklish because mm -hmm. it's the common thing to see. And then for... Um, fantasy books or or uh, magical books um there's other elements that show like sorcery or witches or something that's common so that you know that it's a certain genre and when authors make a mistake of not looking at those types of books because they want to be different mm -hmm. or they want to be in a new category or they can't figure out where their category falls into. So they decide to come up with something completely different. It confuses the reader mm -hmm. and it makes it hard for us to understand from looking at the book, what genre it is and whether or not we should pick it up. Well, and that was, I remember going back to our process, that was one of our early challenges because, you know, uh, the Urbantasm series kind of straddles uh, literary, almost avant-garde fiction, um, but also it's got young adult characters and, you know, it's, its audience is largely young people. And so we needed to find a way to have those signifiers for YA fiction, but also have those signifiers for, I guess, what you would call more serious literary fiction. Right. Um, and that ended up being kind of, um, kind of a balancing act. Yeah, that was a process that we went back and forth on. I think you started with the, an idea originally about what um, the, the fiction that you were trying to portray in, in the art side. And then after a while, we just followed certain techniques that are in that genre. Mm -hmm. But then Sam came up with other things and it took us down a wonderful path. <laughs> so. Well, and that was one of the things I, I couldn't have possibly understood or, or really appreciated before going through that process. It's like uh, you need to have collaborators that you trust. You need to vet, you know. Uh, uh, I had been working with Sam for many years, so I was confident early on that I wanted him to do the design. Um, but I interviewed a number of different publicists before, uh, you know, Darcy and I felt that we were a good fit for each other on this project. But the thing is, uh, once you do that work and you've gone through that process, it really opens up a lot of opportunities because we were able to have very rich and detail-oriented conversations. And I think, you know, I was just kind of going back through those 100-plus emails earlier today. And Darcy, your first choice and my first choice were different, and neither was the choice that we ended up going with. It was Sam's sort of incorporation of our suggestions across his different concepts that led one to eventually emerge from the pack. But I don't think we could have uh, arrived at that point if it had been like, if you hire a designer off Craigslist and send them your request and then they throw something together, it's, it's not going to have that that rigor, which really leads you to something, something wonderful. Right now, the one that you're talking about, was that the ones where we were taking an item out of each of the books and sort of focusing on the, the cover, um, like the magical glasses or something like that? Or was it the, was it prior to it? I think it was in the first, Sam and I have been talking for a few weeks <laughs> Um, you know, before you came on board and uh, he had narrowed his, he had had like six or eight core concepts and had narrowed them down to four. Um, there was one I liked more than the other and it was not your favorite. And I want to say it was the one where it featured the sunglasses very prominently. And you said, those look like Harry Potter. People are going, right. this is a right. Harry Potter book. <laughs> and I, which hadn't occurred to me, but you were, you were absolutely right. They were Harry Potter glasses. And then, um, and then the one that you like, if I recall right, it had this sort of like 
reflection, like there was a puddle on the ground and the buildings reflected off the puddle, sort of a mirror within mirror effect. Right. Um, but the one that we went with, which was sort of the, uh, this, this abstracted atmospheric skyline, um, right. you know, that was kind of a, a dark horse. And, you know, there was, there was one moment in particular, because Sam, you had, um, I'm, Sam will probably show it later, so I, I shouldn't get into too much detail, but um, <laughs> it was basically black and white and yellow, like lots, or black and blue and yellow, lots of black, lots of blue, couple dots of yellow. And then Darcy, you made the suggestion that you wanted sort of a more of a, almost a luminosity to the mm -hmm. blue. And so Sam, you added uh, an effect to kind of like create this glow around the building. And all of a sudden, like even just that one revision. It was like, made, <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, my last question I will have before I see, uh, see what questions people have submitted and if you want to submit questions, you've still got a few minutes because there's about a 20 minute lag between my talking and uh, YouTube. Uh, Sam, uh, you don't just do book design, you are a graphic designer writ large. And so I, I think one thing that comes with this versatility, um, how do you balance the creative demands of your clients, the reasonable creative demands or the less reasonable creative, how do you balance that with the exacting parameters of book production? Because a book is not like a website. There are very, very stringent requirements you have to submit in terms of the resolution and like the amount of bleed, which is, you know, the printer's capacity to mess it up and still have it look good. It's just very, very precise. How do you, how do you kind of balance all of those different variables? Um, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's harder because you have those exacting demands. I think in, in some, in some aspects, it actually makes it easier because, you know, you know, you're given dimensions that you have to work with. It's not like you have a blank canvas that could be a foot wide or three foot wide. And you know that it has to have a certain amount of text that has to be legible and preferably legible from a distance. So, you know, then at some points the text becomes um, part of the art itself and then works with the other elements in there. And then, you know, you get the bleed and the guidelines and everything that kind of shows you how to crop and, and balance the book. And then um, the, the further refinement of course comes when you add in, you know, uh, page count, the, you have to be flexible as to if you're gonna have, you know, a, a graphic design on the spine of the jacket and not just, you know, a solid color how you want that design to be featured or bleed, uh, as well as the back, you know, if you're going to have, you know, part of uh, the uh, image extend to the back or be replicated or be something different. That's something that can be developed um, in the process. But I think those kind of restraints really, really help focus uh, the art and design to get that uh, balance that everybody needs. <clears throat> All right. And uh, in just a moment, I'm going to go and see if we've got questions, but there were a couple other sort of like things that I also thought might be of interest to readers here. First, um, I just briefly went off uh, my bookshelf and grabbed some covers that I remember as being very memorable. Uh, so uh, I just thought I would, you know, parade them across very briefly. Um, this is The Wizard of the Crow by Noguji Wathiongo. Um, he's a Kenyan writer and he wrote this kind of magical realism uh, story or this parable about, you know, about insurrection in the fictitious country. And uh, I just think that this, this, you know, cover manages to capture both like, you know, the idea that this is going to be a politically topical book because of the signifiers, the flag, the, the, the you know, the chapeau, the very, you know, bold, you know, almost like flag-like uh, colors and, and, and such, but it's also got this whimsicality and this sort of like collage type feel, which, uh, you know, s suggests the magic in this story because it is a story in which a lot of fantastical things happen. Um, this is the newer translation of The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky. I'm actually trying to finish this right now. Um, but, you know, it, it's just very clean and tidy and 
you know, really speaks to the dynamics of morality and, you know, the, the struggle uh, to, to evaluate what is a pure life or a good life that is kind of the heart of the plot in that. Um, I, I kind of poked fun earlier at writers designing their own covers, but, but this is one that I actually really like. This is uh, Juna Barnes, and she was um, an avant-garde writer of the early 20th century, and she did this uh, illustration of um, her, you know, her second novel, uh, you know, which is also kind of surreal, but it, it's very much about like the dynamics that she had with her father. So this sort of domestic agrarian scene, you know, kind of almost done in this almost makes me think of like wood blocks, like people would carve out blocks and use them as stamps. Right. Kind of, you know, that that this is a book that deals with archetype and mythology. And then a, a very famous one, um, of course, is the cover of The Great Gatsby. I know, I know some people are sick of seeing this cover all over the place, but it just speaks to me. It's just so evocative and so rich in detail, and you can keep looking at it and see more. And then my friend, uh, Reinhardt Suarez, who's actually a contributor to Gothic Funk Press, this is his first novel, The Lords of Badassery. And, you know, Darcy was talking about about okay. genres and you see a cover and it kind of tells you what to expect. I feel like this is a great example. I you love this, it. You see this, you know exactly what you're getting in this book and it, it does not disappoint. <laughs> so um, let's see, let's see if we've gotten some questions so far. I hadn't seen any question marks. I have seen some comments. Um, we have uh, one comment from Neil C. Uh, which says, if people didn't judge a book by its cover, there would be no work for me. Um, but that actually, uh, I think, <laughs> is, it's a funny point, but there's, there's something, if I may soapbox for just a second. Um, I think a lot of writers, and I used to be this way too, are very nervous about collaborating. They're worried about collaborating with publishers or with designers or with editors because your book is your baby, and you are worried about you're, you're worried about you know what's going to happen to uh, to your child. Um, and the truth is, like all of these collaborators, you have a chance to work with. Um, they all have gifts and perspectives that are beyond the ability of one person, no matter how genius they are, uh, to really be able to act upon. So look at it as an opportunity um, to have people in your corner fighting for you, fighting for your vision, and really, you know, try to grow from what they're able to bring. Um, Anna, <laughs> Anna Clark uh, is asking, uh, when do we get to see the cover? Uh, <laughs> it's coming up soon, Anna. Um, I, I, uh, I'm really excited for Sam to show some of his early concepts. And after that, uh, if we don't have any further questions, we will get to the main, main order of the day. So Sam, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about the process and show people some of those those early, early drafts that we worked on? Yeah, sure. I can I can do that. I've got uh, all of those all those old things saved. Um, I think the hardest part of, of any project is really getting started and where to get started. Um, you know, full disclosure, I haven't I haven't read the book. Um, for most of the covers that I've designed, I usually, you know, design them without reading the book. Uh, but that's part of the collaborative process, you know, working with the author, um, you know, explaining what they want or what the book is about. And then, you know, I can kind of interpret that based on the genre or, you know, like, like Darcy said, uh, the uh, uh, a particular visual style that's present in that type of uh, mm -hmm. um and from there, it's just kind of going through and uh, well, collaborating with Connor, you know, I knew what kind of a, a color palette he wanted and, you know, some of the uh, iconography or um, imagery that he wanted. And so from there, that kind of uh, uh, narrowed it down. So, you know, he wanted like glasses and purples and blues and kind of like an industrial type thing going on. So from there, that kind of gave me um, a starting point. So I think I'll share some of those um, some of those things here. Bear with me while I bring over here. Okay. So this is what we were discussing earlier. I'll just I'll just cut right to kind of our final four concepts uh, and then I'll I'll rewind a little bit. But 
Um, the one on the far left is what we um, eventually turn, turned into uh, the final cover for book one. And then there's three other concepts there. So you see the, the Harry Potter glasses that neither Connor nor I <laughs> you know, made that correlation. Um, and then we've got the one with the, the puddle and the reflection and kind of like the scrawled uh, graffiti type writing. And we have the one I think that uh, Darcy favored, the one with like the, the glowing effect and it kind of adds that mystical psychedelic nature to it. Um, and so what, what I really like doing is uh, in addition to the collaborative project is I'll work on um, multiple images at the same time. So whether it's for, uh, for my own professional self, if I'm drawing a, a, a picture or a print or something like that, I'll make three different ones. And then as I'm making one, I'll go and work on the other one. And then I get ideas working on all three of them that I'll merge together to create something better than any individual one. So that's kind of what we did here is we took, um, as we, we moved on to the final processes, you know, took like the glowing from the fourth one and added it to, you know, the factory of the first one and the, but brought in some of the color palette um, from the third one there. Um, so let me go back and show you some of the original ones. This one, I, I have to show you this one. Um, Connor loves MS Paint and I believe <laughs> this is his, uh, his first attempt. I think this is my cleaned up version of something that he hastily put together in MS Paint probably 20 or 60 years ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Really, really like this one. So this one just kind of like set the mood for the whole thing, I think. Um, and so then it was uh, kind of idea hashing. So you see here, these are some, um, started going down a more minimalist and a very bold look. So these were ones that uh, either I pulled out or Connor pulled out. And so I just saved them to my ideas folder and I would kind of bounce back to them. Um, you can see this one here has a, uh, you know, big, bold text and you get some of the um, uh, uh, distorted, uh, distressed look along with the texturing on it, which I'm a, a big fan of. Um, and for this one, you get, it's a even more minimalist uh, design, but you still get that little splash of color and a little splash of, you know, surrealism with a photo collage in the corner. So I, I you know, I like this one. I like the gradients, the rainbow colors there. Um, this is another selection that we went through. So these ones were, I believe, just a, a collection of uh, minimalist posters that an artist had put together. But I really liked the way that they turned out. Very sharp, distinct lines on the shapes and everything. You see here, there's the uh, inverted factory, which is a, a motif that I kind of played with, you know, the um, skewing reality on its side, I guess. Um, here again, uh, bold use of color and shape that I really liked. Um, and here you've got a really nice contrast between the colors that I was a fan of. Um, and I think one of the concepts that I developed was just uh, you know two or three colors. Um, so th this, is, this is really useful for that. Honestly, um, love or hate Pinterest, it's really good for just kind of looking at a whole bunch of things all at once. Um, to really get your creative juices flowing. Um, I still, I really wanna read this book. I haven't read it, full disclosure. But Gravity's Rainbow, this is a great, uh, a great cover here. Again, you've got kind of the um, urban landscape down there on the bottom, and you've got a little bit of that, you know, psychedelic otherworldliness going on in the sky. Um, and so from those, let's see, I started to hash out concepts. Um, we'll just kind of, quickly go through these. So I think I banged out, uh, looks like about, I think I went through about eight and then made four or five more uh, in the process. So playing around with uh, the glasses and you know, distressed urban architecture here, glowing text. Mm -hmm. Or with uh, distressed or, you know, the distressed texture and uh, decayed urban ar architecture. And I think what I did for these was I sent, um, I sent a whole batch of these to Connor and he would go through and, you know, pick which ones he liked or if there are any ones, you know, he just despised, we would just toss those out and, you know, kind of continue on from there. But that's the beauty of creating, you know, six or seven or eight of these is, you know, some are going to be winners and some are going to be losers. And then the ones that work well, you just kind of start to 
to merge those together. And that's how I work with uh, most of my clients to accomplish their uh, design goals is, you know, I'll give them two or three proofs of concept and then they pick what they'd like. And then we kind of merge that together to really, you know, uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, I think I was a big fan of this particular one originally. Um, uh, I like the, the glowing text and we started to play with the industrial architecture at the bottom, um, but it just doesn't have that, uh, I think, psychedelic flavor that we were looking for or, or I was looking for. Um, this is of course the, uh, uh, the base that we went with um, and further developed into other concepts, but got the very minimalist stark colors. And then later Darcy suggested, you know, well, how about we merge these things and really make that pop out. Um, glasses motif, uh, a little bit more twisted version of the one we saw earlier. Very uh, minimalist version, very Harry Potter. <laughs> so we decided to nix this one. Um, and then a few more concepts of earlier ones here. This is another one I was just kind of doing a, a more literal interpretation of what the book describes the glasses as, um, but we just nixed this one as well. Um, oh, actually, I should point out, you can see uh, the title for Bantasm was uh, something that we further developed here is we, we liked the way that the letters were decaying in this and the very big block uh, font that it chose to use. So that we incorporated in the, the final covers. Uh, okay, so this is an exploration of uh, the four um, the four different book covers. Connor, is it okay if I go through these, even though they uh, show yeah. the titles of the other two? Yeah, I, I think that would be really useful because I, I, I you know, maybe that'll give people a, a perspective on all the different directions one text can take to uh, to a cover. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, so for this, what we were doing is uh, Connor would explain to me, uh, you know, a particular motif or item or subject in each of the four different books. And then I expanded upon that to kind of get uh, a holistic view of all four covers, what they might look like together as a unit. And then kind of, you know, as I would draw one, then I could draw the other one and then go back and refine the first one and so on and so forth. Uh, give me one second here. Do, do, do. <laughs> The screen's going right. Okay, so uh, here we see the cover for the first book, obviously, and then motif for the second book. Early concept for the third one, <clears throat> and the fourth one. And another thing that we took from this exploration is you'll notice that the title kind of gets more and more decayed and distressed as the books mm -hmm. uh, progress through the series. Uh, and so that was another thing that we took over and combined with block font. So I'll just kind of show you, these are the latest rounds here. So then we began to decide, you know, which one we wanted. So we went through an email chain uh, and kind of narrowed down the things that we liked. And we went with this version and and the second one added a lot of, you know, backlighting to it and streaks in the sky. I added, you know, clouds um, and the, uh, the house that's uh, overshadowed by the uh, factories is starting to take shape. And then you can see the, uh, we've taken the, uh, the block letters from the title, turned them on their side to give it a, a really unique uh, and distinct look. Mm. But I really, love that one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, remaining, you know, <laughs> legible, which is which is a thing I always fear. It's like, oh, no, I'm going to print this. Out. Oh, God, nobody can read it. It's an eight point font. Why didn't I check it? But I think we succeeded in this <laughs> pretty well. Um, and I lightened up the colors a little bit, um, which is uh, another element that we, we played on with the covers. You can see the difference between the first and the second book. The sky will start to change color, I think it's, it gets dimmer or, you know, more foreboding as the, uh, as the books progress. <clears throat> uh, we went, in this one, you can still see the house is kind of just like your average Midwestern bungalow. Um, and then Connor wanted the house to be a little bit more 
How would you how did you describe the house, Connor? Well, I, just, I described it as Victorian, but um, but <laughs> but the first Victorian was like the Adams family house. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so as you can see here, uh, the house that I drew ended up being a little bit too Adams Family. So uh, <laughs> tone it down just a little bit. Um, and so here, I believe, is the final cover that we went with for book one. Mm -hmm. You know, I did a little bit more research into Victorian houses and kind of went with like a, a Victorian Queen Anne style uh, farmhouse here overshadowed by the uh, overshadowed by the factories. Um, I did, I did add, I'll, I'll just point this out. Um, one of the little things, not really an Easter egg, but one of the little things that I use in my design motif is uh, you'll see these uh, X's throughout like the factory or tree branches uh, and even in the clouds. Uh, that, that was just a design style that I really like using and playing with. But um, Connor, if, if you could tell a little bit why the X, I guess is significant. Yeah. Well, in, in the book, there's an automotive company called X Automotives, which is pretty obviously a stand in for General Motors, but um, it's X Automotives. And then there's a neighborhood called the O's. And so you have this almost like tic-tac-toe X shape and O shape motif kind of playing out throughout. And I was super excited when I found out that that was Sam, something that Sam was incorporating into, uh, into his cover designs. Because, like, uh, for example, the window on the house is circular, but it's got, you know, the cross X shape in it as well. And, the, you know, there are other examples of that in, in each of the books. Um, let's see. So, yeah, so that's, uh, that's all the, uh, the images here that I have currently set to share. Uh, do you have, Connor, I guess, Darcy, do you have any questions or about that spread? Well, we did receive a question um, from Neil, and uh, he says, uh, there seem to be different approaches representative of the story and characters and symbolic of the story. How do you decide which is appropriate? So in a way, in a way you, you kind of spoke to that, but you know, are you going for, how do you balance what's symbolic with what's representative? Um, hmm. I, I think for me, like the, the symbolism in the story is, at least in my art, is a little bit more implied or perhaps in like my use of, uh, you know, the exploration of color that I put into it or the fact that, you know, the whole kind of book is turned on its side. Um, and the more, you know, literal things would be like, you know, the farmhouse and the factory or in, in later covers like uh, trees, that sort of thing. Let me see. Uh, let me see if I can pull up uh, book two. Uh, uh, Darcy, did you have any questions about what we went through? There? I I just wanted to say that I, I think that what happens with writers and um, and artists is they have to figure out what is the point that they want to put forth forward for the reader to grasp. So in mm -hmm. Connor's book, there was a lot of um, items that we could have pulled out. And when we first started talking about covers, it was actual items that were prominent in each of the books and we were centering on that. But then at some point we switched and was thinking that it's really a story about the town or the city that it's in. And that became our focus. And I think that's how, um, why we went through this other complete different direction and everything was on its side um, because that was the, the point we wanted to get across about the decaying city and, um, and certain items pulled out that were illuminated, uh, which I thought you brilliantly put together. Thank you. Um, I will share this. I'll share a little bit of development I had here between, um, between Cover two. While you're, you're calling that up, I want to, to maybe add something to what, what Darcy was saying. Sure. Which was, um, you know, Darcy, you didn't really draw any like block sharp lines in the sand for us, but I think about the closest you came was you, you were emphatic that it would not be a good idea to use a photograph or a photorealistic illustration of any character. That would be a bad move. And 
do you want do you want to say something? I mean, I I interpreted that as having a meaning, but I'm I'm what what um. <laughs> what? <laughs> I was thinking from genre specific. So, um, you know, having a, a photograph of a, of a character mm -hmm. in that genre wasn't normally done. Um, the way we, we had started with the different key elements of a, or an element of each of the books is the norm for the genre. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think taking another element was fine. It was just that I, I didn't want the reader to think it was a different type of book because we were going about it with a very specific um, type of, of graphic that's seen elsewhere. And I guess that was probably the only line in the sand I drew for you. <laughs> do, you um, do you think yeah, with genre fiction, uh, that sort of literal representation is more is more typical than in, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want, uh, literary fiction is such a fraught term, but still you have like these Jasmine Ward books and right. you know, where it's like, it's the letters, it's like a background color and it's the title right. and then the author's name. And I mean, it, they look really, really cool, but um, it's But very it's fun. not the right genre for you. So, um, but I, I do like the illustrative quality that's on, on these books um, for this audience that we're looking for. Uh, and I think it's something that they're drawn to is that illustrative quality. I feel for me, I cannot wait till your last book is released and then I can have all four covers on my wall and look at it because the covers tell the story. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a thing of beauty. Uh, if I may, I'll, I'll just cut to uh, the, uh, the book two development that we had here, Connor. Um, <clears throat> so this was uh, after we, you know, obviously fleshed out the first book um, with, uh, with its, its color treatment and the use of the font and how we were decaying the fonts and everything like that. So then we worked together to make all four covers more or less at the same time. Um, they would get further refined as, you know, the, the publishing date came, but um, this was uh, book two from the process. This was an early draft for the cover of book two, um, which then further refined into, come on now, this. So, you know, took away a lot of the trees, took away the silos and made them these industrial towers. Um, and then kind of, you know, continued playing with the X motif and the, the clouds and the change of the colors. Um, that's what we came up with there. Um, the font kind of decaying a little bit. Um, yeah, so I will uh, cut back over to Connor, I guess, if you have any questions or comments about the book two process. Let's see, we got a new comment. All right. Um, I think I think that uh, that about covers it. Um, oh, I wasn't even trying to make a pun there. <laughs> If you think of questions, and it could be questions about the business side of things, questions about the design process, questions about how authors navigate this. One thing that we haven't talked about at all is that you will have a very profoundly different experience if you were with a big six publisher with an agent than you will have if you were working with a small press than if you were self-publishing. You may have absolutely no say over your cover. You may have all the say and you're completely overwhelmed by all of the choices um, you know, that's something that makes a huge difference. But if you think of any questions later on that you didn't get a chance to ask, uh, shoot me an email, um, connor at connorcoin.com. Uh, you know, I'll put my heads together with Sam and Darcy maybe, and you know, I'll, we'll, we'll get back to you because I really did, you know, really have hope that this would be not just fun for us, but also informative and useful for people tuning in. So I'm about to reveal the third cover, but there's one last thing that I just want to say, which is, I think unexpectedly, but with great delight, um, Sam's designs uh, with Darcy's help have really called attention to the value of physical books. And I say this as somebody who loves e-readers and e-books, um, but this is a cover you can interact with. You know, there's the way you would see it on your shelf. You know, there's all of the like 
color saturation on the front and the stark, you know, three colors on the spine. There's the fact that Sam, and this is something Sam does with all of his designs, is he continues the motifs on the front, on the back. That's why you have like this, you know, twilight fading from the, the recent sunset on the cover. And then you have, you know, the erosion of the text that we talked about. So if you look at book one and book two, the lettering is a lot more eroded on book two than it is on book one. The city has continued to decay as the story progresses. And of course, that is a theme which has continued to book three and book four. I am saying this as a word of encouragement. I think more people buy books when they when, when it is a complete work of art. And when you are able to experience the cover and experience the physical presence of the book, you know, in a way that you can approach it from different angles. Okay, that is enough for me. I am gonna go ahead and share the third cover. Um, if I can like, you know, be sufficiently technologically. So this is Urbantasm book three, The Darkest Road. Does everybody see that now? And let's yeah. see. Yeah, can you can you guys see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, all I will say about it, I guess this is like one more Easter egg before we wrap up for the night. Uh, the book that you see here, the 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 house that you see on this cover, is the same house that you see on the cover of book one, that is foregrounded by the factories. And in fact, uh, I was so <laughs> captivated with the way Sam designed this house that, um, that I went back and uh, edited the description of the house in the text to make it more closely resemble his design. Um, but there you have it. That is the uh, grand finale. So, uh, Love it. <laughs> so. Uh that's really cool. Yeah, it looks great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Darcy. And thank you, Sam, for first for, you know, going on this journey and helping to, uh, you know, make these beautiful covers and, you know, help me create a product that I could really be proud of. Mm. And then, you know, thank you also for, you know, uh, tuning in tonight and having this conversation. And, you know, it really has been a lot of fun to me, you know, these, uh, these author events are the most fun when you get to connect with people and reconnect with people. And I almost feel like, you know, it's not even COVID tonight. Like we're just hanging out, having a conversation. That's <laughs> great. All right. Well, I think that that's everything that we uh, had to talk about tonight. So I just once again, want to thank my guests, want to thank Jessica for moderating, thank uh, Gothic Funk Press, thank the Foot Festival of Writers. And uh again uh, i'm looking forward to seeing everyone next time yeah. All right. take care and have a beautiful safe restful weekend